Hey everyone. Um, let's just wait a few more minutes and then we can get started. Um, this week I am, I think we'll have Monday and Wednesday lectures on Zoom. Uh, and then starting next week, we will be back uh, in the class itself. I think I should be back by uh, Friday night. Um, maybe while we are connecting, I guess uh, one of the threads would be is uh, on the short presentations. Anton, can you remind me, are we doing them today and Tuesday or? We did, uh, we did about five of them on Friday. Okay, at the class itself? Yeah. Yeah, and then do you know if that covered everybody or is there anybody remaining? Mm, I think there was one, one group that reached out that said that they would uh, like to do it later. Okay, um, so maybe next Friday, this yeah. coming Friday, yeah. Yeah, and those uh, are very, then, very short format. Yeah, and one of the threads that I'll do is uh, I'll send out uh, on that Friday, uh, sort of just one-on-one -on -one times for next week. Uh, that will be valuable in terms of uh, also just expanding a couple of other mentors relevant to the projects itself. So I think uh, one thing that would be valuable is uh, uh, send me a note, either just either Discord or Slack, or we can uh, send a summary of certain sets of needs that people might have as well. So I think that would be I want to select per team uh, certain sets of individuals that might be very relevant for topics that people chose. Um, and then Tyler, you had mentioned tonight, 10 p.m. would be the international, the sort of the global community. Uh, yes, I did see your message. Um, I think we can do it one of two ways, depending on what you think. We could definitely push that till next Monday um, when the time makes sense for you. A another option is we could do tonight as the um yeah i'll just do a one-on-one -on -one meeting for the next one much more deeper discussion and tonight let's have people give talks okay great so we'll if, basically do the same thing that we did on monday but tonight with the global cohort yeah the one you did on friday uh oh sorry yes correct and then i'll i'll yeah. see if we can um i'll make sure it's recorded so that uh you can take a look yeah yeah um Okay, yeah, I think let's get started. It's, it's uh, already time. Uh, I think the other part would be is uh, between hybrid and threads, just uh, folks that know other folks. Uh, I think uh, one thing that would be very valuable is, uh, of course, the Friday sessions, it just makes so much more sense to be in the lab, so everybody that can be in the lab should uh, please try to be in the lab. Uh, I think I know a couple people are dealing with COVID and other things, which is not ideal, but that's what it is. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think it would be very useful as now, at least the projects will become a lot more intensive than uh, it's just uh, very valuable to see each other as much as we can. I see some folks are uh, in the class itself as well. Uh, so let's get started. I think one of the big things that we will try doing today is one very important kind of a more technical area. And then I'll also do a little case study to just show you the, the breadth of how to apply that technical area, which is in the context of compliant mechanisms and a class of problems that arise that we can tackle in that space. Um, I already discussed a little bit on the side of one-to-one -one projects. Uh, and I think I'll talk a little bit about the assignment in the very end, but please remind me uh, if I uh, don't get a chance to uh, mention this uh, around uh, mechanism design. So I think I'll cover, I'll cover kind of one of the assignments uh, in a minute. Uh, so I think, let me just refresh one kind of a design approach that I had described. There are many design approaches. Uh, there was one that I had described in the context of uh, Fred Park at one of the lab sessions. 
Uh, and I'm assuming if people can just mention, have they had the chance to draw uh, any Fred Parks for your projects? Was it used in the, the presentations that you all made? Just a little bit of uh, actually doing this exercise. I'm curious, anybody wants to comment if they have done this exercise for a project? So this is, uh, remember we did this for a couple of projects uh, as a discussion. And uh, I had mentioned uh, this would be very valuable to do for each project. And I think, you know, I don't want to emphasize this uh, in terms of uh, any of the common examples, but it would be very valuable if uh, you use this. And I think when we do our one-to-one -one meetings, I know we had conversations with a few sets of folks who were struggling of where to get started. This would be the framework that I would wanna see when we sit down for the one-on-ones. So if you haven't done it as yet, give that a try, but at least especially for meetings next week, uh, I'm expecting everybody should do this for their projects. And we'll kind of dive in a little bit to discuss what you could improve on that side. You don't have to have done any analysis as yet, but it should be clear in terms of what should you do to make progress in that. Um, okay, so I think uh, one of the big things I wanna get started with is compliant mechanisms. Uh, so up till now, we have talked quite a lot about materials, we've spoken quite a lot about uh, utilizing materials to their ultimate uh, function uh, and compliant mechanisms, which I'll describe in a second, are one of the best examples of where you get so much out of very little. So let's start with Lego and I'll ask this question. Uh, I don't know if you've already spoken about this, but uh, I'm just assuming all of you have played with Lego. Uh, if you take two bricks of Lego, and what you're looking in the picture here is the patent from Lego from 1958. This is Godford, Kirk, Christian, uh, and this is from Denmark, of course. Uh, when you take two pieces of Lego, what is the accuracy uh, that you can, if you were to remove those two pieces again and put them again, what would be the kind of accuracy that you could attach two pieces of Lego with? And I'm trying to remember, uh, did we discuss this or not before, but anybody has an intuition, people wanna just chime in. This is at the heart of why Lego works. So you could think about it, that whenever you attach two pieces of Lego, there will be error. And if you add it serially, you should assume, for example, here, if I start making, a, that's the largest Lego structure ever made. As you keep attaching every piece, the error should start adding up to a point that there should be so much error that you should not be able to build a structure. And so the question is, you know, why does Lego actually work? We can kind of just do free really if anybody wants to mention why, why does Lego work? Or you could think about it in the context of why are there intricate shapes that are associated with every bricks? Maybe I'll unshare my screen for a second just to see. Does anybody want to comment why does Lego work? I don't know if anybody has a piece of Lego hanging out right on their table. Any, anybody wants to venture out? Why do two pieces of Lego when you attach, what truly happens when you squish those two pieces together? They lock together. They lock together, yeah, kind of. And then I think it's very interesting to think about, are there analogies between two Lego pieces docking and proteins docking, for example? And we'll talk about that of where these analogies break down and whether if there is something very actually fundamentally similar and different between 
molecular machines and larger scale machines. So when they dock together, there must be number of contact points. And if you really carefully look at the piece of Lego and look at the negative, there are a number of points that it makes contact. And so now the question is, if you were to snap back over and over again, uh, two pieces of Lego, what would be the kind of uh, accuracy? And I'll talk a little bit about using the word accuracy in a very precise way in a second. Uh, what number does come to mind? If you could measure it, how precise is Lego really? I mean, Lego is a millimeter scale object, a centimeter scale object. But when I attach them two together, how accurately can they attach? I mean, it's related to, you can start thinking about, oh, how smooth is that surface to begin with? Because that contact is smooth. But there's something spectacular, and this is why Lego is Lego as compared to many other products that are out there, is that the precision that they achieve is just absolutely remarkable. So I think I'll kind of give out the answer unless somebody wants to venture out a number. I'm, I'm pushing you guys to say a number because I want to see if it breaks your intuition or not. This is, accurate, this is accuracy you're talking about? Yeah, just, you know, just, yeah, we will talk about the differences between the two, but I'm just curious what order of magnitude number jumps to people's mind. When you attach two pieces of Lego and then do that over and over again, 98%. Yeah, so I think, you know, then when we say 98%, do we mean that in the context of the scale, length scale of the object? So if they are, you know, centimeter scale objects, are we talking about they're aligned hundreds of microns or tens of microns or millimeters? Actually, how many people think 100 micron? 10 microns? One micron? Mm. Any thumbs up? Millimeters? Clearly not millimeters. If it was millimeters, it would wiggle. That would not work clearly. 100 so microns. Yeah, the answer is around two microns, Woo. which is really remarkable. And I think kind of now, one of the things that's valuable about this patent is it's using uh, what is called the law of elastic averaging. And we'll kind of dive in into this. So just first of all, on the left for uh, terminology purposes, if folks haven't thought about accuracy and precision, we will use those words, but they mean very different things. So you can just look at that target just on the left. Uh, there is high accuracy, high precision, and then on the right is low accuracy and high precision. Low accuracy is that there was a target that you wanted to reach and it's not accurate, but it is precise that whatever error you get is the same error every time you repeat the experiment. While on the other hand, you have high accuracy and low precision, which is the fact that the total error is limited, but the repeatability is less so. And so you can measure these types of things and people have done that. And there was a remarkable experiment done at MIT using what are called coordinate measurement machines. They're the best machines to measure accuracy and precision. And they gold plated some Lego bricks and they tested them over and over again. And it turned out that Lego was far more precise than the machine they were measuring it with. It's a chicken and egg problem. If you're using a machine to measure something and that machine itself has a certain amount of uh, errors when it moves to a certain location, you can see that you cannot measure something farther or better than the precision of that instrument itself. And what the key point here is, it depends on the number of contact. And the famous law, which is called the law of elastic averages, is essentially when you have random errors, elastic averaging, because every single time two of these Lego pieces fit together, there are deformations in there. 
And what that does is the total number of contact points, essentially many of these errors cancel out to give you an inverse proportional law to the number of contact points. So whenever you're making a Lego project, if you wanna make it really precisely, have lots of sets of contacts. And what it would do is, so for example, here you can see the XY error and repeatability measured. For two Lego blocks, the patent allows you a structure that has 72 contact points, literally just for simple two blocks. While as you go to five blocks, you have 180 contact points and that gives you around you know, three microns in X and Y. And this is really remarkable to achieve, you know, much of, uh, there has been a lot of work that people have tried to do, and it's quite difficult to achieve this type of accuracy. And this is occurring because the brick is not an infinite stiff structure. And if this was not happening, you would never be able to construct Lego repeatably. So it's quite a, it's a very intriguing idea. And then of course, now there are lots of other people that have uh, the kind of mechanisms that you could think about uh, that uh, other entities have tried to make, but uh, much of the patent and the IP in these sets of things are essentially associated with uh, uh, this law of elastic averaging. Uh, there's another version of this, which uh, folks, when you would be building something, and this is relevant for people who will, might end up choosing to build something incredibly precise, uh, which is called kinematic couplings. I'm not going to go too much into this other than just to mention that there are other ways of thinking about accuracy. And then there are methods using spheres and flat surfaces to also achieve just remarkable accuracy. And you'll see these types of structures often enough in things that you might actually build. Uh, one of the reasons this is important is to think about how to reduce cost when you're thinking about building, say, optical instruments. And so some of you might have seen that there is a, people have built microscopes out of Legos. And one of the reasons was, that was given around was the fact that you could reduce the alignment errors, for example. You could try thinking about other objects that require precision and somehow if you could use a Lego as a structure to begin with or try making certain sets of machines that really actually do utilize this elastic averaging as an approach. And we'll talk a little bit about this when I talk about compliant mechanisms for a second. Um, so I think one thing to keep in mind uh, when we now talk a, about compliant mechanisms is I'll just start with this as a case study. Um, is there any question on the elastic averaging? Uh, I just wanna make sure that people have intuitively in their head uh, what I mean by elastic averaging. The fact that errors can cancel out when you have lots of constraints. Does that make sense? And then you can think a little bit about it, whether yes, no. No, Erica, do you wanna? No, I just popped in and then popped out, you know? <laughs> okay, the answer is yes or no. Okay. Uh, uh... Maybe I need one more. Yeah, maybe just explain it one more time. Okay, yeah, let me, let me give, make the analogy. Uh, so often enough, when you think about an object that is docking, let's talk about proteins, for example. So two proteins docking with each other, you can think about you need incredible precision, right? Because these are atomic scale structures and you need to have, say, the exact uh, negative for these two proteins to dock. But the reason many proteins can dock and you can make certain sets of units that can dock is because they are elastic. And just like every object is atomically elastic, there is certain amount of deformations depending on the binding energy associated with it. And so you can create a type of a structure that uh, can still dock even though it has certain amount of errors it's like the wiggle thing, right? It's almost like, That's, you know, when you have ribosomes build, building mm -hmm. proteins and there's a wiggle factor, you know what I'm yeah, talking I about? Yeah, I mean, or... I think uh, the, the wiggle factor here 
is a little bit of a kinetic version of it. But while something has docked, you can think about that that kinetics settles down because eventually when two things have rested. So that's the wiggle is happening in the Brownian regime or at the atomic scale, while here in elastic averaging of macroscopic objects, the wiggle is coming from the force. It does require that force for elastic averaging to happen because that's why you actually push two Lego pieces to snap together into place. And those sets of deformations would come from the force while in proteins, nobody's pushing together. It's just energetically, that's the right form factor. And because they are so soft, uh, they would wiggle to fit in place. Uh, or I guess I was talking about, you know, when your a ribosome is translating, like, MNR, I guess, was it tRNA? There's like these three, like, what are they called again? When you have three that code for a specific amino acid I guess mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. multiple that can code for one and I assume mm -hmm. that's because of like that being able to take different yeah you can and read out yeah you can you can think of it that way but I'm thinking even more generally you know this is a very general idea that uh, docking can occur for a very broad range of elements and eventually uh, I mean, we'll talk about proteins as compliant mechanisms in a little bit later part of today. So we'll, we'll get back to that example in a second. I think that's a little more of a complex example from uh, identification, but it's in the right track. Um, and the way that you should think about it is although macroscopically we think of things as stiff structures, nothing is stiff. Nothing is infinitely stiff. And that's really the focus of today's talk. Nothing is infinitely stiff. And that implies, like, for example, I'm looking at Dolly and she's wearing headphones right now. And that's a compliant structure, right? So if you move that, you can wiggle it. It's an arch. Now, if you put that on somebody else's head that was a little bit larger, you know that this arch will still be able to compliantly, elastically bend to a different structure. And that is by design because it's designed as an arch. Uh, but on the other hand, even the objects that we think are significantly stiff are not. I mean, you could think about exactly how your power charger goes in into the connector, for example. So I just pulled that out and every time it goes in and it's compliant in the sense that these two sets of structures have to make these sets of contacts and the force that you use will enable and you can know and see this that sometimes certain types of connectors are really bad while certain types of connectors are very good, but you wanna be able to design compliant structures to uh, enable uh, the kind of uh, uh, accuracy associated with uh, every single time you're connecting two things together. Uh, I really love this Lego example because again, it is in the context of frugal science because it is very difficult to achieve that type of precision out of everyday objects but lego is everywhere and so whenever you're looking for precision you can think about that uh, in this context um, i'm gonna give sort of a couple other examples so let me first start with uh, i know some of you had seen the ligo uh, discussion that we had before about vibration isolations. I just wanted to bring this picture to remind people of uh, something that we had talked about, but I don't think visually we had shared. So remember when we did the interferometry associated thing for LIGO, for gravity waves, we talked about somehow dampening all the vibrations. And we talked about hanging incredibly heavy mirrors out deep in uh, the ground uh, and canceling all the vibrations. So this is actually one of the pictures of those mirrors that's hanging. And you can see it's hanging on some kind of a strange frame. And as I said before, since nothing is infinitely stiff, you could start worrying about, oh, this structure that's holding should deform elastically. There will be certain types of vibrations in this. How do I build and design structures that will cancel out vibrations? That's one way of looking at it. There's another way of looking at it, which is flipping that around 
to see how could I design me mechanisms that allow me certain class of motions, uh, which uh, might be very difficult to make otherwise. And I think the best example that I wanna start with is really Disney. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples, but I think there are many versions of these. I just wanna show this for a second and let you just enjoy what you are watching. Uh, this is quite literally from Disney Imagineering. Uh, they have a really fun website. You know, if you get to become a Disney engineer one day, you get to imagine all kinds of things. This is a part of a walking robot. But what's really fun about this is other than one motor, it's completely a single 3D printed structure. So it literally walks out of the printer there are no joints other than that one place where you can see the motor is attached. And this is related to the assignment today. But you can see it's performing this very organic leg-like motion that you might think about that would come from many sets of mechanisms, many sets of joints. Uh, and the idea for today is how do we actually design structures like these? These are called compliant structures. Compliant because they are using Often in design, we like to make very stiff structures and we don't want to use the nonlinear part of that bending of a beam. And you can see that it's connecting the two. Stiff rods are connected with flexible rods, are connected with stiff rods. So um, I don't know how to pause it, but you can all see the thick portion and the thin portion. And this is a very clever space of uh, mechanical design that thinks about how can you, whatever function you have, could you actually embed it in a single structure? And these are monolithic structures. They could be printed, they could be cut, they could be stamped, but you can see the amount of assembly that could be reduced, the amount of cost that could be reduced and how you could actually create fairly complex structures uh, out of fairly simple parts. And now, of course, the design is what's complex, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, there are certain sets of tools we'll talk about. Uh, but you know, I just want to start with this because this is just a fun thing. And you can start imagining now, can I build and design a machine? And this is the assignment uh, that will do something interesting, but it only has one degree of motion. But you see it traverses a fairly complex uh, uh, trajectory around it. Uh, so let's dive in into kind of the uh, history of compliant mechanisms. And I always like starting with Cavendish. Uh, I'm curious if some of you know Cavendish. Uh, anybody knows what Cavendish is famous for? Do you all remember? Uh, reading Cavendish's uh, name anywhere ever in your physics classes, maybe? Anybody wants to just jump in? I think whether it was Cavendish, is Lord Cavendish? No? Banana. Banana? I didn't know that. <laughs> What did Cavendish do with bananas? One of the main breeds of bananas is named after him. Or I did not know that. That is hilarious. <laughs> uh, okay, now I have to go find out about that history. I have absolutely no idea. Uh, the other thing Cavendish is famous for is his experiments to calculate the gravitational constants. Uh, and you know we have all uh, thought about this. Uh, you know he's the ex famous experiment that he did in 1798 is this idea of uh, uh, let me see. Okay, the the very famous experiment for determining the density of Earth. So we'll kind of just take a look at this experiment for a second, and it's incredibly beautiful and quite puzzling. Uh, and I think lots of people have tried to actually replicate it, but its design is so simple that you just look at it and you just, 
kind of think about go and miss uh, you don't believe whether something like this should even be possible so the apparatus he describes it in 1798 the apparatus is very simple it consists of a wooden arm six feet long made so as to unite great strength with little weight this arm is suspended in a horizontal position by a slender wire 40 inches long and this part is important to each extremity is hung a leaden ball about two inches in diameter and the hole is in closed in a narrow wooden case to defend it from the wind. That really is it. What you're seeing essentially is an object hanging on a certain amount of weight that's hanging off of a wire. And I think uh, I'm just gonna show you guys a video of this because it's much more fun to watch this video. Uh, this is something that you could literally replicate to calculate essentially the gravitational constant. And it's quite puzzling to think about that you could literally do it in your dorm room. So I just want to point out, I don't know how if people can see there is a really thin wire that's going through here. There is a beam with two weights and then there are two masses attached here. The idea that he came up with is if gravitation is a force that is existent in all objects, can I have tiny objects attracting each other? So what would happen if you have two balls here, this object should be technically attracted to this. The other object should actually be technically attracted to that. And if I have something, I'm gonna try to mute this. Uh, if I have something suspended, and you can see the clock. He left the clock up there. So it's, uh, there's a clock right there. So this is a very slow experiment. Like, you know, this was left at four o'clock. Uh, two masses were put in there. And let's just watch that. And you are literally watching uh, gravity in action. And you will see, you know, actually just, couple minutes pass by and these two things tilt. And the fact this happens is, is quite strange because you know it's, it's supposedly is a very weak force. I mean, of course, if you have earth and you have an object, you all know and feel it. But if you were to calculate it from just the simple laws, you know that mass of the objects matter and these masses are very small. So how can you build and design something so cheaply that could still be incredibly sensitive to such a small force? And Cavendish was brilliant in when he came up with something like this because people at that time did not really believe that you could do something like this at such small scales. And, uh, you know, kind of one of the things to think about is why was he capable of doing this? And again, this exact same mechanism was perfected by Coulomb to then actually measure uh, charges, which is again, an incredibly difficult thing to do. It's a small force. And there was a trick associated with this, which is, so what we care about here is, you know, you could do this with charge, you can do this with mass, but the reason this is a compliant mechanism is you are thinking about a twist of a wire. And uh, you can all pull your hair out. I think I know I had asked you last time to do that as well. And then just take a look at the hair, for example. And what I'm talking about is not the tension, but the torsion. And what I mean by that, and it's a little bit hard to do, uh, but you could attach a ball to this. And if you were to twist the ball, uh, you are actually fairly easily able to twist something. And hmm. one of the key ideas that Cavendish at that time came up with is he wrote down the mathematical formulation. He was the first person to write down how does torsion of a wire depend on its dimensions? So you can see, I just want you to focus on this. The left side is force. That's the amount of torque you can apply on a wire. But the right side, 
is inversely proportional to the length. This is a little bit intuitive. If I make very long wire, you know the amount of twist should be linearly proportioned because the amount of twist that is resisting, I mean, just like a spring, you can squeeze a spring or you can twist a spring. Uh, that should be somehow an intrinsic property of just the length itself because the total twist is distributed linearly along the length. So the linear relationship is intuitive. But what came as a surprise, and this is something that you can do with beam theory, is it, the, the twist force has a to the power fourth of the diameter, which implies that if you were to reduce that diameter by half, you would get half to the power fourth in the reduction of the torsion. And so if you keep reducing it finer and finer and finer, you can make a spring that is so incredibly soft that even gravity from a bowling ball will actually be able to be detectable. And that was the idea. And again, you know, for Coulomb's experiment, he literally used something that was 30 microns, a very fine wire. And from that, you can actually measure charge. This experiment was incredible. And again, some of you who have read Marie Curie's, for example, biography, many of you know that measuring charge was an indirect measurement for many of these radioactive assays as well. So this experiment was one of the most sensitive experiments of those times and has been used, torsional springs have been used for a long while. Uh, there is a, a kind of a historic myth. I have to trace that back, but I think I remember reading that somehow a cat whisker is a really good torsional spring. And so people would go searching, I don't know, I'm not suggesting that if any of you have cats, you should pull out their hair, but if the cat willingly gives you a hair, you could actually try playing with it and see what's so special about it. I think the reason people were using cat's whiskers, if I'm correct here, is that any error in making, like any defect, for example, any grain boundaries in making these really fine wires, would lead to anomalous torsions. And somehow the biological production of hair and specifically cat whiskers, which were just long enough, uh, was because you know our hairs are maybe not straight, they're not uniform. And so these calculations are difficult. I think vaguely I have a memory, but I, I couldn't find the reference today morning. So if some of you could find that, uh, I have an intuition that cat whiskers are relevant uh, in this discussion. So very simple idea that Cavendish came up with allowed him all the way to build the world's most precise instrument. For the next hundred years, nobody could beat his measurements. And still today, you can in your dorm room actually get pretty accurate results uh, in the context of measuring the gravitational constant. And again, I think it has to do with understanding the problem so deeply and uh, essentially using very simple ways of implementing this. Um, one of the things that uh, is fun is, you know, people have gone and replicated this and demonstrated that he was capable of making these classes of measurements. Uh, there's a beautiful series of papers that tried to replicate methods for how he actually made his wires. And in that same context, I think another really remarkable achievement uh, around these types of ideas is also, uh, I mean, for folks that are interested in history, there was a jump in instruments, precision of instruments before and after when diffraction gratings were made. Uh, this is another type of a, a an idea that eventually, as some of you remember in frugal optics class, we talked about diffraction gratings. They became very important as a component, but mechanically it was very difficult to make precise gratings until George Harrison came along and he came up with a very clever, very simple mechanism that completely revolutionized many measurements in optics because diffraction gratings could be made really well. 
And so hidden behind some of these remarkable advances are some very simple machines. Uh, and those sets of machines uh, actually utilize compliant mechanisms. So torsion is one of the simplest of compliant mechanisms, but we're going to do some more complex things. Uh, and so the first thing I wanna start with is a crimping mechanism, for example. This is often given as a common example. I'm sure all of you have seen the vice grip. Now, there are two ways of implementing a vice grip. One is this traditional method where you have lots of parts, you have joints, you have to assemble it. Or the other is this kind of a funny looking shape in which you have a hand and some areas where you remove the material and somehow this also does the same function as that. But now because this is monolithic as a structure, there is very little cost associated with uh, how much it would cost to actually make uh, something like this. And now the question is what you see on the left, how do we go about designing structures like this? So it looks like a very strange shape, which is also true for that Disney mechanism that I showed you. And that part is not trivial. That really is an art in a certain sense. And this is where I wanna make this analogy with proteins uh, kind of very specific. When you think about proteins and you think about something like allostery, where you can have motion or movement or binding on one part of the protein actually impact completely different part of the protein, the design is really a compliant mechanism and we have no idea. We, as yet, as humans, are not great at designing allostery. You cannot just build it from scratch because we don't understand how these sets of forces would propagate at these atomic scales. But at larger scales, we've been thinking about this set of an idea that if you have an arbitrary shape, which you can see on the right, which has certain amount of input forces, could I randomly remove certain materials, add certain materials, change the density or stiffness of certain materials to get a very specific output at a given location? But if I could do this in a monolithic structure, suddenly you could reduce the cost associated with building a fairly complex mechanism. Uh, there is a lot of work that has happened in this field for maybe I would say the last 30 years. Uh, and I think some of that, what I'll try doing is for the folks that are really interested, I would be very happy to run a kind of a session that goes into the nitty gritty of design of these mechanisms. It's quite a, uh, you do, it does require a certain amount of dedication associated with picking up certain terminology. But today I'm just gonna give examples. So folks can have an intuition around it. If you like 3D printing or a little bit of CAD, we'll start with some very simple replication of other people's mechanisms as well. It does take time to pick this up as a skill. So let's start with some you know, machines that are made out of uh, compliant mechanisms. So if any of you have a 3D printer, you can think about it. So let's just stare at this object for a second. And if anybody is interested, could you explain, uh, does it make sense to you that when you were to pull that red region down, you would have the tweezers close? Does that intuitively add up in how you think about this? Anybody wants to chime in? I can move to the next one. So, you know, you can break this down into certain parts that are flexible and certain parts that are stiff. So very clearly the bottom structure, I don't know if some of you can see my mouse, this is stiff. So we know this is too thick, it's not gonna move, that acts as an anchor point. We can also see that this structure in the middle is actually, uh, can you all see my mouse? I'm not so sure, I don't, okay, you can. Yes, we can see it. This is stiff, this bottom is stiff, so, and you're only moving it down. But then you start seeing the first time this line and this line are not stiff. And so they would bend. And suddenly that will generate torsion at this point and a torsion at this point. So that makes sense that this is starting to tilt in this way. But it's not so easy to think about how it would twist because then this beam itself is anchoring this point. But overall, this is one mechanism that converts linear motion into sideways motion. And you can use this as a motif 
any place you want because then you can use this structure to add something else to it. Now kind of let's go a little more complex. Now you can see this is a structure that is converting the same horizontal motion to another horizontal motion. And the trick here is that maybe you want to make something move but not rotate. Like you want these two green edges to move but not converge inwards. And actually this is why you have this funky seahorse looking, two seahorses looking at each other. It's a, this is a little bit non-trivial to think about. Um, we can move to something like this. <laughs> now it gets hard. Uh, now, if I had removed, I think I should do this for the next one. If I remove the arrows, let me actually quiz you guys on this one. So I'm going to try this because uh, sometimes I find it very hard to figure out how these mechanisms would move. So let's take this as an example. While could I draw uh, a box around it? Uh, oh, I know what to do, yes. Okay, I'm just gonna hide it. So, I don't know if you all wanna play this game or not, but there. Uh, so now um, we have this object. Uh, can everybody see my screen now? We are pushing this to the top. The two squares are blocked and you can see this funny structure and I can just tell you what I have hidden. These two structures are actually connected to each other right here and right here. And I'm just curious at these two points. Um, you... I can't see the top of that picture. Oh, I've hidden it. Because oh, I don't okay. want you to see the answer. <laughs> There are, there are two arrows drawn on it, and on okay. purpose, I have hidden it. I just want you to think about uh, how, would you, how would you start thinking in terms of what's happening in a structure like this? And, and again, you know, this is very non-intuitive. There's no, I haven't given you a recipe, but I, I'm just curious if some of you can just crack it, or some of you yeah. might actually have intuition for this. I don't, but I feel like you'd start at the bottom and just like kind of see what would bow first. Or like you kind of like try to okay. start from where you're applying pressure and you try to think about, yeah, where things at the very close part of the pressure are going to bow. And then from there, mm -hmm. you work your way up. But yeah, I don't but know. let's, okay. So that's a great idea. Let's look at these points. If you ignore everything from the top, can somebody tell me what will happen to these points, these two points, and you are applying a pressure top? Would they go inwards or outwards? Would they move outwards? Like they would out, outwards. That makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. They would move outwards because I can now tell you that this edge and this edge actually acts like a joint. And it acts like a joint. And in that scenario, there's a deflection here. There's a deflection there and they move outward. But now if these sets of structures are moving outwards, you have another structure right here and another structure on the top. But interestingly, if they were not connected by this single beam here, you would assume that this structure would also move outward and this would move outward because there's no coupling. There is no force chain that is coupling between the two. But now the complication comes, the fact that this is a contact point and this itself as a beam cannot stretch. So the one way of thinking about these compliant mechanisms is the beams can bend, but cannot stretch. They are springs when you bend them, but you cannot extend their lengths. So this structure finds it hard to stretch, but it can bend. It can either buckle this way and it can buckle that way. If it buckles this way, you get this thing to come together. If it buckles outwards, you get these things to go away from each other. So uh, does anybody wants to guess what's going to happen? I'm, I'm going to reveal the answer at this point. 
unless somebody has figured it out, outwards or inwards? Okay, Suzanne has her hands outwards. Anybody else? There, you know, there are no points being deducted for being wrong, so you guys should venture out. I am curious. I'll be contrarian and say inwards. Okay, contrarian inwards. The answer is inwards. And, you know, again, I'm not giving any intuition to this. This is extremely complex sets of designs, but I just want to sort of just as an aesthetics share this because uh, one of the power of these mechanisms is that they are atomically smooth. Now, what do I mean by that? If you are about to design a machine that requires you to build something that moves at atomic smoothness, that would be pretty difficult if your joints have certain sets of gaps, if you like, if you were to make prismatic joints. But because beam bending is essentially atoms lined up and you can essentially have atomically smooth movements, uh, many of these sets of mechanisms have remarkable sensitivity to the sets of uh, deflections. Now, the problem is that they're also very sensitive to unwanted deflections. So you have to strengthen them to suppress unwanted deflection while enhancing uh, the deflections that you want. And that is exactly the challenge in protein design because we don't have, I mean, there are two challenges in protein design. One is from sequence, we don't know what it's gonna fold, but that's, a, you know, we're getting there. But if you were to just first ask, how do I design a machine like that, that because of Brownian motion, won't just completely fall apart and do random things all the time, which what a linear chain of polymer does, it just forms all kinds of configurations. You have to strengthen certain parts. There are certain sets of interactions that are effectively stiffer, while other sets of interactions are much more uh, softer. Uh, do we want to do another one uh, as a quiz? Actually, we'll, we'll kind of, I'll send this out. Uh, but again, take a look at this one, for example. Uh, if you press down, can anybody explain why that goes down? I mean, this is the answer already, but. Yeah, because the left side of the beam is going up. Okay, left side of the beam goes up. So I see the that. So you've identified there is a joint right here. This is a prismatic joint. That makes sense. That's a lever. This goes up. That means this goes up. And there's another joint here. That means this goes down, right? Okay, you guys are getting good at it. Let's do a couple more. What about that? <laughs> uh, Okay, is this obvious? The one that I'm looking at now? Again, something very similar. These things are going in. Uh, that leads to very directly. And actually now this is a little bit complicated. For the first time you're seeing curve beams and curve beams have curvature that is intrinsic, that is stress-free. Unlike other beams that when they curve, they were stressed. This is actually a little bit tricky. You are resetting its original point to have stress-free curvature. And so you are biasing it, for example. And then so if you are going to tilt it this way, the beam by in a biased manner will actually go up. Unlike, so let me give this example. If one of you have a uh, coffee stirrer or something, or just something that you hold in your hand, squeeze it, there are two possibilities. It'll either buckle up or buckle down, right? But that will introduce noise in your mechanism, which could go both ways. That's problematic. So if you want to have it buckle up, just give it a tiny bit of curvature which is in its stress-free straight. And then when you squeeze, you know it will always buckle to the top. Does that make sense? So it's a very simple idea of using curvature to bias a kind of a bending mode that will not be symmetric anymore. So you've broken, this is called uh, breaking symmetry. You've broken the symmetry of the system 
to be biased towards buckling only on one direction, which is exactly what's happening here. Uh, okay, let's look at, ah, this is a fun one. <laughs> And again, I just want to emphasize is some of you feel overwhelmed looking at these. What is that game that we play? Te Tekagram, like this Japanese game where you put uh, triangles together. Tengrams. Anyway, I feel like there's, this should be a box game uh, just for you to play. Uh, this, I, you know, I think it's very difficult to build intuition for these, and there is many people that build and design these mechanisms for a living, but there are, uh, there is a method to this madness in terms of thinking about uh, converting any kind of movement into any kind of other movement. So, um, you know, I think every block that you move you can certainly linearly solve it other than just one problematic issue with that is that there are force chain loops. So many a times when you have loops, this idea that you are linearly moving towards a deflection breaks down. You have to account for these loops for this to actually work. And as you can see, there is you know infinite number of these. I wanna show one of my favorite, which is very non-intuitive and I don't see it here actually, so I'll come back to it. Um, but the, the notion that I just wanted to mention to all of you is that this is a massive design space and it's really fun. It's fun to think about, but from a manufacturing perspective, once you've come up with a design, you can literally stamp it and you can build many of them in large scale, which is really hard sometimes to do for larger mechanisms. So. Up till now, we just talked about flat sheets. This is not true just for flat sheets. You can actually build this in now from a rotational axis. So let's take a look at this one, for example. This is a fun one right here. I'm curious, uh, what do you all think is happening here? So you can see certain kinds of slits that are cut across, and this is a thin plate. If it's a thin plate, the bending is actually not in plane, but it's out of plane. So you can see this that and intuitively you should feel if you were to hold that white piece, you will be able to move it in the axis along the white plate, but you cannot jiggle it in X and Y. So the only axis that you can move is along this long axis, but you cannot move in X or in Y. And let me just draw that for a second. How do I do that? There is a way to do that. Uh, uh, annotate, annotate. Does anybody know how annotation works? Uh, okay, I, I don't seem to see how annotation works. Okay. Maybe you could use the Zoom feature where, where it says share screen, there's an option to annotate. So it wouldn't actually be on the image, but we could still see it. I see, but how do I do that? I am on my Zoom controls, apps. No, not apps, I don't want. I go in more and hide video panel. Yeah, no, it's, that is a bummer. Okay, um, yeah, I think that's what I use all the time, but I cannot seem to find that. Okay, um, I'll continue. Uh, that's uh, usually I'm able to do this. Oh, you know what? I might not be host. That's what's going on. Yeah, Tyler, can you check if you can make me the host? Uh, let me check. I thought you were the host, but uh, maybe something weird happened. Let me verify. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I think if you can uh, see whether if that changes anything or if any of you can draw on it, try drawing the Z axis, just so just this axis. Uh, but I think, you know, the point that I'm trying to make here is just it's valuable to think about this, not just in a flat plane. We just discussed flat plane, but all of this actually works in many different planes. Um, okay, so now I come back to kind of 3D printing, and this is really at the heart of 
uh, much of these sets of examples are from Disney, but there are a couple others. There is also the open flexure out here. Uh, this really started to take off when we started coming up with an idea of being able to print arbitrary geometries. Now that's really interesting because you can make a functional mechanism in one single shot. And there are a couple of design tools that have been built that we will talk a little bit about briefly. Uh, but it's valuable if you go online uh, on a couple of sites to first build a motif or get an intuition for the class of mechanisms that are out there. Because most often, best compliant designers look at what others have done, mix these sets of mechanisms in other different ways. I'll give you the key uh, language or components for this, uh, but uh, it's actually very valuable to try designing your own. Now, some of you might not know this, I, you know, I think, uh, but uh, there is a really fascinating space of uh, how the nuclear codes are, uh, work in terms of thinking about the mechanisms that are associated with uh, controlling the firing of nuclear arms. And one of the challenges there is that Many of those sets of mechanisms are mechanical compliant mechanisms. And so the fact that you can take these mechanisms and shrink that down to be on a chip is what has been done for a long time. And many of those mechanisms are mechanical primarily for the reason that you want them to not be sensitive to electronic noise, for example, or EMPs. Uh, but that's what is in the middle between uh, certain sets of weapons that are used. Uh, uh, and I think one of the threads to think a little bit about is these sets of mechanisms, although now at smaller scale, they're difficult to make, they still have incredible reliability. So one example of, actually, no, let me just ask you, what is the smallest compliant mechanism uh, that you can think about that works, that you all use every day? Where can you, that's at small scale. Uh, anybody wants to think about an object that you all, you know, I think you all use every day, maybe every other day or something. But of course, large, you can, you can think of many, you know, a toothbrush is a compliant mechanism. So that's easy. Every bottle cap, when you look at, for example, uh, hinges, almost hinges on our, so many of you have seen these hinges, right? There's no joint here, it's a single object. And if you look very closely right there, that's a compliant mechanism. Uh, you can see thin piece and a thick piece. And now once you know it, you will find these everywhere. And it enables manufacturing in a remarkable way. But I'm curious if anybody can come up with a microscopic compliant mechanism. Actually, I'll give you a hint. And this one is not the answer. It's like AFM is a very simple case. You have these cantilever tip that's used for imaging. I mean, that is a compliant mechanism. But can anybody come up with, a, with something that you use that is a compliant mechanism, but at microscopic scale? What comes to mind? I think the moment I tell you, you all will know the answer. So I am curious if uh, anybody figures this one out. Any guesses? Let's just list some other, any, any common compliant mechanisms that come to mind that you use in daily life. It doesn't have to be small, it can be big. The credit card? Credit card, that's an interesting one, actually. Um, I mean, in some sense, the fact that uh, when it goes in, uh, I mean, it is, a com it is compliant in the sense that f it's flexible, but it's not really exploiting the mechanism so directly. Uh, I think there are contact points that you could say on the other mm -hmm. end in which the, the chip has to have electrical contact and it has to be compliant for it to make a contact. So 
technically all plug points are compliant mechanisms. And you know, if you take a airport flight, it's in flight, it's very annoying that your power charger falls off all the time. That's because it's lost its compliance. Only the people who take too many airplanes will know this. But uh, so, I mean, one example, which I find it remarkable is, I don't know how many of you have opened up your old uh, DMD projectors. So do people know how digital mirror projectors work? The, I mean, everybody's used a projector here, right? Uh, there are literally thousands and thousands of mirrors. Okay, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm realizing that many of you might not have opened up your projector. So let me show you a picture of it. It is one of the most beautiful, uh, uh, the feats of engineering. So let's look at this for a second. So I just searched a DMD projector chip. Texas Instruments makes this chip. That's an SEM. Every one of those is a tiny little mirror. So as you can see on the left, and the mirror can flicker. So when you're watching a movie on a projector, what's really happening is these sets of mirrors are flickering to project light and that's a pixel on and off. But look at that thing under it, right there, which is a mechanism for, so did you see this addressable mirror? It's tilted and the other one is flat. That's on and off. And there is this massively incredible mechanism right under it, which allows, so this is another example. You can see all of these mirrors are tilted in different ways. And lots of light falls on it, but this one you would see as one single pixel of a given color. This is another color. And they are, you, I mean, once you've gotten on and off, you can turn this into color. But under each one of them, if you look carefully here, you will find this incredibly complex four axis tilt. And there is, uh, I mean, it's basically compliance and all of this is built in that when you buy a DMD projector, you get all of this for free. So this is another <laughs> beautiful mechanism. You can see right under it and it enables this very precise tilt. And here is the actual mechanism as you can see. So that's the plus minus 10 degree tilt. These are the electrodes for tilt angles. And of course, you have to have a compliant mechanism for it to be able to bend in these four ways. Uh, any of you can now, I think most of these things have been hacked. So you have a possibility of literally programming this for all kinds of function and you get literally you know, hundreds of thousands of these little mechanisms in a tiny chip in an old projector. Uh, you can figure out different things to do with it, but this was a remarkable feat on going to a point because unless you could build this reliably, uh, it was useless because you would have too many dead pixels. So, you know, I think one way of thinking about this is that many of these sets of mechanisms are all around us if we look hard enough in terms of thinking about, uh, is it obvious, do people, get it right in terms of how the DMD meter works. Um, yeah, and I think you should all open up a projector at some point of time if you find a old projector that you don't like anymore or it stopped working. Uh, also, I think now Texas Instruments has released the chip so people can build other functions associated with these DMD meters other than just displays. Um, okay. This is another fun one. I like this one because of just uh, the creativity involved. Uh, this was a beautiful paper that looked at compliant mechanisms to make logic gates. So just like I describe uh, this notion of uh, control mechanisms, this is thinking about very simple beams that would turn on and off. So you can assign memory, but it's a mechanical memory. So what you see is happening here is that you could state, if you push something up, it's on, that's one. You can define that as one. You push something down, that's defined as zero. 
And now, and this was the input. And so you can essentially start stacking them together and you can build literally arbitrary complex logic gates associated with this. Um, there's a really fun GitHub project. If any of you is interested, it's called Mechanical Computing Machines. There are certain limits to it because there are certain sets of errors that are associated with it. But uh, this is one of the, it's a fun way of thinking about logic gates that you could implement completely in compliant mechanisms. I think one of the problems in this is that it doesn't cascade very well and errors do pile up at some point of time. But theoretically, it should be possible to make very complex mechanical logic gates using something like this. Um, I think I'm gonna transition to uh, give you one or two, just a perspective on the kind of design tools that are used to make compliant mechanisms. And for the folks that are interested, I'll dive in a little bit deeper, but I wanna end today with just a problem that we've been thinking about for a while in the lab. And you know, I know you've all chosen your projects, but I still wanna mention this in terms of thinking about what can you do and apply these ideas for problems that we kind of care about in this class. But before that, I think this is one <laughs> compliant mechanism that I built in grad school that I got excited about. Uh, this is actually a XYZ data stage. Uh, I built this out of aluminum. Uh, you can see it's a thick aluminum. It's cut on a water jet, which is a machine that I think is available on campus. This is the classic way that people make water jets. Now, the fun part about this machine as compared to something that requires many motors and actuators, it's a one-to-one -one replica of what is on the left that's called the Delta stage, but it's just made out of these four pieces. Uh, but this has an incredible accuracy in terms of what I can't do with many parts. You would require so much amount of assembly associated with this while I built this as a stage for SEM. And you can see here that triangle itself is designed in a manner that I have arbitrary X, Y, and theta control. And this is a little bit hard to wrap your head around, but what's powerful about this is to how do you decouple rotation from translation? Because when you translate something in compliant mechanism, it might also rotate. I don't want to do that. I want to linearly translate something without rotating it. And that's why it's coupled in the way it is that there is a set of instructions of moving these screws in a manner that it will cancel the kind of a rotation that would occur when you translate. And similarly, it will cancel translations when you rotate. Rotation is simple. If you think about moving all the screws simultaneously, equal distances, you can convince yourself that this stage should rotate. Translation is not so easy. But anyway, I just, you know, this is kind of my uh, history with compliant mechanisms and that's kind of how I got started. Um, actually, let me skip the theory on this, but I will just mention that I'll cover for anybody who's interested in seriously designing compliant mechanisms in one of the lab sessions that I'll do. Uh, but I also realize that if some of you might not be diving in into that space, that this might just be a kind of a, something that you're excited about. So here are the three key components. Uh, there are, you can think of what is called a pin flexor, a blade flexure, and, an, and a notch flexure. And I think some of you identified these objects already in the mechanisms that we were talking about. Uh, but this is really at the heart of you are positioning these in different locations. Uh, and uh, actually, yeah, so I'm going to pick up on this side on the theory of flexor machine design in uh, another one of the lectures, uh, just on folks that are actually excited. Um, let me do one thing here which is, oh yeah, this is one of my favorite examples. Uh, so what about biology? I mean, we talked about small scale structures, but can you think about larger scale structures where compliant mechanisms are used in organisms, just biological examples that are large scale? 
all the way from humans to insects to anything comes to mind. So I don't know how many of you. Like, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna ask in terms of like tools the animals use, or in terms of actual like the. No, just animal bodies, like. Oh, animal bodies. You know, so can you think of them as compliant mechanism? Flagella is a fantastic one. So whosoever said flagella, you just won lots of bonus points. That is fantastic, because it is incredibly programmable. So one of the fascinating things about flagella is that it is a compliant mechanism. So it's made out of microtubules. We don't actually understand its design principles, uh, primarily for some really surprising reasons, is the fact that it is phenomenally programmable. I mean, most of us think of as flagella just doing one thing, but if you actually do microscopy, you would realize that flagella can have many, many different modes. And how that programming happens that you can take the same elastic object but move it in many different ways is still an open question. Um, also, yeah, nobody's actually been able to ever engineer a flagella. Not even at the small scale, we have not even be able to replicate it at a large scale. So we don't have an example of a macroscopic mechanism or a structure that behaves like a flagella or has any level of complexity that flagella has. And one of the problems to think about is up till now, I talked about compliant mechanisms where there was a single input and a single output. What's fascinating about the flagella is its distributed input, that the motors are distributed across the elastic structure. So they are pushing and pulling everywhere because as you all know, for the structure of flagella along the long length, uh, which is what a cell uses, for example, to swim, uh, there are motors distributed along the way. And I think I'm realizing if some of you have not seen the flagella before, maybe at a later time, we'll kind of dive in in one of the lab sessions to see if you can come up with an idea to either program a flagella or use those sets of compliant structures in completely different ways. Any other, maybe macroscopic, let's go bigger. I think we went from proteins to flagella. We wanna go bigger. What other compliant mechanisms that you might have seen in insects? Yeah, let's just focus on insects, for example. What about flight? What do people think about flight as compliant mechanisms? Has anybody seen a beetle uh, take off? Antennas, that's a good one, actually. That's a good one. Although I don't know if they're using their antenna motility as a function. It's flexible, but is it flexible for function? Maybe it is actually. Um, you know, not from Drosophila, I now know moths use their antennas as haltiers. So first of all, do people know what haltiers are? I'll just show a picture just so that people have an intuition for. So next time you go catch an insect, like a fly, look at it closely and you will find something really strange. So, you know, let's look at a house fly for a second. Can you see that little nub tucked in under the wing? Uh, that little structure right there is called a haltier. It's a mass attached with a tiny beam that oscillates. This is the same thing in this crane fly. You can see a little mass. This is, a, you know, derived from a wing. A wing becomes the structure. It's just a rod with a mass. But this is actually an insect gyroscope. So as an insect flies, this thing starts oscillating at the same set of a frequency as the wings are beating. And then when an insect turn, because now this is a mass on a spring with a certain oscillation, it actually acts as an inertial light, just like the IMU unit on your cell phone. I mean, many of you know that this cell phone is measuring its accelerations in X, Y, and Z using compliant mechanisms. And you can 
record it. That's why there are apps that you can shake. It's, I mean, insects did this long time ago, but they can do this in flight. So if some of you have not finished your full scope assignment, here's a challenge. Can you mount a fly, image its halteers while it's flying? Uh, and I've never seen, I've never seen data uh, like that. And I think there are tricks to trick a fly to fly while it's mounted, which is you put it upside down and you stick with wax its back. And when flies legs are not in contact, even though they're stationary, they think they are falling and they start flapping their wings. But now the challenge is, could you image halteers that way? So anyway, this is one structure. Another really fun one that I always enjoy is how spiders leg works. So I don't know how many of you have played with dead spiders. They are really fun. Uh, one question is, you know, when spiders die, why do they crawl up like, uh, you know, their legs kind of go inside, they crawl into like a ball. And that's primarily because flies legs are actually hydraulic compliant mechanisms. So they are compliant in the sense that these joints are just springs, but they in the pressure inside this to be able to open and close. So, you know, if you think of spiders, they are hydraulic robots. Every moment that they're stepping, they're generating pressure from the pumps to move. And it's a very clever design because then you can think about a single power source and have control on which valves you should open and close to actually control motility. And this is something that you can do by just finding some big spiders. Uh, so this would be another full scope uh, project if anybody wants to do to see how that works and can you come up with a mechanism that's associated with this. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, so one thread to do here would be is uh, um, search for more compliant mechanisms uh, because they are remarkable and they're everywhere. Uh, I'm realizing it's 1.40 in my end. Uh, Anton, do you know how much time do we have left? I was going to do a little case study for prosthetics and compliant mechanisms, but I'm realizing I might not have the time. Yeah, we're, we're scheduled to end at 4.45. And I am where? Oh, five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Yeah, let's, if people can open their videos, maybe we can just have a chat on uh, assignment. I'll just mention the assignment and then we can just have an open chat in terms of any questions people might have, uh, threads on logistics and projects. So the assignment for this week is you have to make something that moves by itself. Uh, and there is no other constraints, nothing. You can imagine whatever you want to do, make something that moves by itself. It's not something that you should be touching. And uh, it could be as complex. It could be has infinite number of compliant mechanisms. It could be anything. I think if uh, folks haven't built things that move, uh, you could start very simple. It just depends on where you're starting. I know some of you build and design machines. You could push the limits. It would be really fun if you made something uh, that I often joke about this and with friends and uh, since grad school, we've been talking about this, a machine that walks out of the printer, uh, uh, which would be that it's completely printed and the, the moment you print it, it actually can walk or move. But you can think about any sets of scenarios, just uh, the assignment is you can combine compliant mechanisms with origami, which is a massive space. You can combine it with kirigami. Uh, but uh, it's kind of an open-ended. You could also see if certain sets of projects that you are thinking about actually have compliant mechanisms, then you could also use that as a framework too. So, uh, but it can also be isolated. Um, that's the assignment. Uh, any questions, any kind of thoughts, threads that we might wanna cover? I think I realize I 
cover way too many things in these Zoom sessions. And um, I'll be back on um, Friday night, US. So I think we'll also cover a little bit on the one to one uh, meetings next week as well on the project side. But um, yeah, any questions, any ideas, things that come to mind? Uh, I know some of you have been thinking about larger scale mechanical things. <laughs> I'm not seeing, uh, uh, I know the discussion around polio prosthetics, <laughs> but I'll, I'll bring that up as a case study in terms of thinking about could cost of prosthetics be reduced. Actually, some of you do know the case, there was a legal lawsuit around running where a prosthetic runner was beating many people that were regular runners. Uh, do you guys know this? Yes, no. Oscar Pistorius from That's South correct. Africa. correct. And I don't know what the final legal verdict was. Was he allowed or not allowed to run in the Olympics? He was allowed. I think he was allowed. He was allowed. But if you look at his blade, that is actually a compliant mechanism. There are no joints in it. It's It looks stiff. It's, it's just kind of a bent shape and you could ask yourself why that was and again it can be manufactured but it essentially stores energy and every stride and gives us back which is exactly what our tendons do except his does it quite effectively and uh, you know one of the big things in the space I'm just hinting it we will talk about this next week in the need for prosthetics and really rethinking what prosthetics even mean for people, especially in a cost effective sort of a setting, is that we often think of these sets of things as disabilities or something that's not capable. But in that case, and again, in many more people, the way we have to imagine and think about these sets of solutions as being far more capable of what the biological analog should be able to do. We're not there yet, but at that same time, it's actually valuable to think about as that field is moving so fast, it's also leaving a lot of people behind in terms of, you know, lots of people, which uh, if you think about it in the context of access, uh, still use a hook as the best case scenario for a hand prosthetics which is what we'll talk about next week. Literally, I mean, the hook that we have all seen in movies and videos around pirates and that's, that's it. That's all we got. That's the most common arm prosthetics. And actually this is not even the context of developing countries. This is actually very common here as well. It's very functional. It is actually a very clever design. It does 90% of the things, but it doesn't go beyond that. And, uh, cost is a huge issue around many other next generation prosthetics. So, and the hunch that we've been thinking about is that compliant mechanisms would be a phenomenal place to think about much more complex yet easy to manufacture uh, prosthetics. Um, okay, I will stop talking here. Anybody has any questions? Uh, I'm just opening the chats. Uh, Oh, I like butterfly proboscis. That's a fantastic compliant mechanism. Uh, and actually, it would be interesting if any of you want to uh, fold scope that. Oh, let me just ask, did, did people finish that fold scope assignment? I have a habit of share, giving assignments, but I never ask you all whether you're actually doing them. So did anybody play with their fold scopes? Did you see anything? Yeah, yeah, I there... did it. I just haven't uploaded it yet, but I took a sticker on the tongs in the dining hall. <laughs> and then, yeah, I think it would be awesome if you all post it. I will only read it if you post it on the community site because I want to see your work right next to a 10-year-old from somewhere else. Just to tease you all, uh, yesterday I imaged, uh, I got bitten by a jellyfish because we've been spending way too much time in the water and realize that I can image nematocyst. So I'm hoping you've all been stung by a jellyfish before, right? 
or I am assuming, not hoping. Uh, but here you? is <laughs> money. I am actually at a field station in Italy, uh, in Stasion Napoli. Uh, those are individual nematocysts uh, on a jellyfish. I can also bring the jellyfish. I have the jellyfish right here. Uh, that's my arm. Uh, I don't, it's not that bad now, so you can see that. And uh, I'll bring the jellyfish in a second, just so that you can see it. Wait, and this is the jellyfish that stung you? Or no? That's the ultimate scientist at work, right? <laughs> I think they are dying. They're not doing very well, but I had to catch the one that uh, stung me. So <laughs> there are 10, 15 of them in here. Yes. Uh, and uh, I was actually quite excited by this because I had not anticipated that the density of the stinging cells will be so high. There are literally, I mean, millions and millions of these, and that's what it makes sense that it's not a single contact. It's millions of them entering your skin right away. And it's, uh, uh, yeah, it, yeah, it was fun. And um, that's kind of what I want you all to do is that you can reprocess something that happened to you but you can process it in a manner that will bring you joy. Uh, so I think, yeah, you have to push yourself. I am excited about reading uh, uh, reading about it. And again, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be bitten by a jellyfish or something. You could be bitten by a honeybee or something else too, or a spider for that matter. But yeah, I think it would be really fun to uh, see if you go through a genuine aha moment where you don't understand something you look at it and then it closes a full circle to say, oh, now I get it. And then it will lead to many other questions itself as well. So let's see. Uh, yeah, please post those online and then we can have you compete with other people that, are, that do that as well. Yeah, I think as background, I had, uh, I'm part of a NSF uh, grant on trying to understand the uh, role of viruses in the ocean and pandemics in the ocean for carbon flux sequestration and uh, uh, the biological pump. And so this is one of the pilot expeditions that we had planned a while ago that happens to be right in the middle of the class. That's why I have to teach at midnight. Which, uh, and I have to wake up at 7 a.m. to head out to the boat. Uh, but I should not complain because I am in Naples. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, nothing to complain about. Um, okay, so I will, I think we'll do a Zoom session on Wednesday again, Wednesday night. But then uh, after that, I'll be back and then we'll plan. Uh, I'll send out a message on the one on one chats as well for the meetings. Um, and I'm excited about. Uh, projects. I know most, almost everybody is now part of a team, right? I think okay. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. I think it's one fifty already. Sorry for running a little late. Uh, and we will see you all uh, on Wednesday. Great. Bye, everyone. Bye. And thanks, everybody. Enjoy, enjoy the pizza. Oh, this is the place where pizza was invented. Right. I know. Uh, I have not I have not been I have not been to the actual restaurant, but I'm gonna try to go. Go. Yeah. Go. <laughs> we we really have like sixteen hour days. It's really nonstop. So <laughs> but I have to figure out a way to go. Yes. Well you have you have good coffee too. So that ought to keep you I going. Do. I yeah. do have good coffee. <laughs> Bye, Susan. And again, yeah. thank you so much for the session last week. That thank was you. really, really fun. But I was worried that you wanted to present some things and I went too long. No, I think it was just perfect. Yeah, I think it's the to be able to discuss the virus as an intellectual context while all this is happening is very important.
Yeah. And I think it's, it's I, I want to stretch people in the regime of things that they're also thinking about, you know, both in diagnostics and in the context of vaccines, it becomes very valuable. I'm going to cover the inequality side of that story in a little bit. So Good. it will weave in, I'll do that a little later when yeah. I'm in person. Good. I think yeah. it's also a delicate conversation, so I want to have it in person too. So just, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Bye, Susan. Yeah. Ciao.